time that we do it. We have a new series that we're kicking off this morning. And it's on the life of Jonah, on the book of Jonah. How many of you are familiar with that scripture and, and that story? And, and so I'm going to go ahead and tell you the end of the story. Uh, Jonah gets eaten by a well, spit out, and then he does what God is calling him to, him to do. So that's what I remember from it. The other day I was going to minister to someone, and, and I actually stopped and I read the whole book because I wanted to uh, make sure that I had it down. And as I read it, as an adult, there was so much more things that popped out to me that, that I understand now that I didn't understand when I was younger and, and that I didn't understand when I was wasn't as faithful to the Lord. So there's some things that I want to show you in the life of Jonah. So this is going to be um, probably several weeks uh, series, but uh, let me tell you, you're going to leave blessed. Uh, you might leave with your feelings hurt just a little bit, but that's all right. Uh, sometimes we got to break our pride in order to allow God to move. Amen. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Jonah, chapter one. And we're going to be reading verses one through three. Jonah one, one through three. And if you could stand to your feet once you're there. Some of you need some help finding the book of Jonah, huh? The Old Testament, I, what? In the beginning of your Bible, there is a concordance that tells you where exactly uh, Jonah is. Or if you turn to page 459, uh, more, more often than that, uh, not, it won't be there. Jonah 1, uh, verses 1 through 3. Jonah 1 verses 1 through 3. So we're going to be reading the first three scriptures and then we'll begin uh, with a word of prayer. And the Bible says this, Now when the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. If we can bow our heads as we begin with the word of prayer. Father, we just thank you first and foremost, Lord, as we come here into this place, not because we are seeking to be perfect, but Father, because we are seeking you. We are seeking fellowship. We are seeking worship. We are seeking prayer. We are seeking uh, to be discipled, Father God. Lord, that's what church is to us. So, Father God, as we come here, Lord, I just pray, Father God, uh, that the seeds would fall where they fall, Lord. Uh, for it is not my job to direct it to any um, particular situation, any particular person. But, Father God, may the Spirit convict where it needs to convict. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. We thank you, Father God, to be surrounded by a community of brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. We may be seated. As we read this story, I often remember being a youth, hearing this story, and not really understanding why Jonah chose to disobey God. I never understood, and I know God called him to go to the city of Nineveh, but I never understood why Jonah didn't want to do it. I thought maybe he was just lazy. Maybe um, there was a quinceanera going on in, in Tarshish, and maybe that's where he was going. I didn't understand why exactly that Jonah uh, chose to rebel against his creator. In fact, when this happened, Jonah was already a prophet. Jonah was already a prophet. However, God gave him a new set of orders. God gave him a new uh, people to call out to. So in scripture, we read that uh, God is calling them to a great city. Not great city, in fact, because it was awesome. Not because they had a beautiful skyline. Not because they had these bridges to West Dallas. But God was calling um, Jonah to Nineveh that it was a great city because it was a large city as far as on the scale of those ancient times. In fact, the city of Nineveh was actually a important city, a capital city for the Assyrians. I know a lot of you may not uh, be well educated in, in church history and uh, Israelite his history, but the Assyrians were mortal enemies of the Israelites. 
mortal enemies of the Israelites, right? So Nineveh, as you, we hear this, that uh, God was calling Jonah a prophet to the city of Nineveh, which was in the middle of his enemies. A city in the middle of his enemies. So you have to equate it as this, that we are sheep. God is calling us to the lion's den. Not just to the outer gates of the lion's den, but right unto the middle of the lion's den. And God is calling Jonah to prophesy, to tell his enemies that they better get right or God is going to come after them. That they need to repent. The Israelites and the Assyrians, they were constantly, say constantly, constantly. at war. Always fighting. You don't have to repeat that. Uh, constantly at war. Always fighting because that's what we do with our enemies right we're constantly at war with them we're constantly fighting them in fact the assyrians had a reputation a reputation for cruelty that is hard for us to understand it has been said that when their armies captured a city or a country unspeakable atrocities would occur they were well known for skinning people alive decapitation, cutting off their heads, mutilation, ripping out their tongues, and gouging out their eyes. In fact, we see this in the movie 300, and we think it's just Hollywood, but the Assyrians were known for making pyramids of the human heads of their enemies. They would cut off their heads, and they would build these great pyramids. The Assyrians were nasty people. They were the enemies of the people of God. And it, ancient records show that the Assyrians boasted of this kind of cruelty as a badge of courage and power. So to say that the Israelites hated the Assyrians would be valid. It'd be okay to say that. Just like you say, uh, Crips hate bloods. Just like you say, people from Pleasant Grove hate people from Oak Cliff, right, back in the day. Uh, junior homeboy hates uh, PGV and West Side Warriors hate uh, Midnight or whatever. I, I, I don't want to take you back in the day, but understand we have enemies that we indeed hate. So we see that the Assyrians and the Israelites hated one another. So when God asked Jonah to go and preach to the city of Nineveh, he was essentially calling him to preach to his enemies. Now do you see why Jonah disobeyed? Now does it make just a little bit more sense that Jonah, being a man of God, preaching to his own people, calling out to his own people, it's not like the Israelites had it all in order. They were a mess. They were filled with sin and rebellion. He was preaching to his own people. And God said, no, no, I don't need you to do that right now. I need you to go preach to your enemies. And Jonah looks around and is like, Lord, I'm, I'm doing work here. This is kingdom business. And God said to Jonah, I know that, but I need you to go over there. We tend to preach only to those who we love. And that is the cold, hard truth. We tend to preach to only those we love. Because when we preach to someone, when we really preach to someone, it is because we love them. Because I don't think in this church we raise up people to be judgmental. We don't create people to, to, to kick you when you're down. Um, those kind of people are not wanted nor accepted here in the House of Healing. Because we want to rise up people that are encouragers. But people who are unafraid to tell the truth. To be bold in their witness. So if someone is preaching to you, then they love you. If someone is saying, hey, man, you need to get right, it's not because they're judging you, because they love you, because they don't want you to go to hell, because they don't want you to suffer, because they don't want you to end up in the belly of a well. They are saying, get right with God, because the change going to come, just like Sam Cooke said. When we don't love, we don't care. Sometimes we don't want to pray for our community because we don't care about our community. We don't want to pray for people that don't look like us because we don't care about people that don't look like us. They're not the same color as us. They don't speak uh, whatever language we speak, which is not really Spanish, not really English. It's a mixture of the two. 
And unless you look like us, unless you think like us, then you can't be a part of us. And we can't pray for you. We can't reach out to you. But the Bible says that we have to go out to all people, and that includes our enemies, beloved. But when it comes to our enemies, delight rises in our hearts when we see them suffer. Fact of the matter is, we love to see our enemies suffer. We love to see them struggle. We love to see our enemy fall. And we say, that's what you get. God don't like ugly. You're getting exactly what you deserve. We love to see our enemies fail. We love to see them destroyed. We love to see them murdered. We love to see them condemned to hell. Is that true? And none of us would probably go that far. Some of us would. But some of us probably would say, you know what? No, I can't, I can't go there. I can't say that I want them to die. Can't say that I'm, I want them to suffer for eternity. Let me tell you, if you're harboring that, then that's another form of hatred. And the Bible says, how can you hate your brother yet love God? You cannot hate your brother and love God. So we're focusing on the life of Jonah. We're going to be focusing on his life for several weeks. I know sometimes uh, you go to churches, then they have the tendency of, of focusing on these old stories that you read about, yet not making it practical, yet not applying it in today's everyday life. There are great things to learn from the men and women of the Bible. So I want to take you to the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 27 through 35. That's where we're, we're going to be focusing on the majority of our scripture. I hear you say amen when you're there. Amen. Let me tell you that every single one of you have enemies. Every single one of you have people that do not like you, that cannot stand you, that wish ill upon you. Every single one of you. Because what? Haters going to hate. <laughs> I have come to know that that is a fact of life, that haters are going to hate. But the Word of God says this regarding our enemies. Luke 6, verses 27 through 35. The Word of God says, and the words of Christ, more importantly, say this. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. This is why Christianity is so difficult for the majority of people to follow. Because our natural way of life is so opposite of what Christ wants us to do. You can see it like this. What we want us to do and what God wants us to do often do not coincide. They are opposites. Because um, cursing those who curse you, that comes natural, beloved. No one has to teach you to do that. You learn that all on your own. We grow up knowing that. We teach our kids that. If they hit you, then hit them back. The sad thing is, once we grow up, we carry that same mentality. People that curse you, you curse them. If they shoot at you, you shoot at them. If they wish ill upon you, you wish ill upon them. If they're doing brujeria on you, then you pray uh, that God would strike them. Because we are, as Hispanic people, there's a lot of superstitions around us. There's a lot of superstitions and there's a lot of witchcraft. There's a lot of people trying to pluck your hair so they can uh, put curses on you, beloved. But, but, but we believe that the power of Christ is the greatest power in this world. That there is nothing that can come against God. If you are a child of God, there is nothing that can come against you. There ain't no witch on this earth that is greater than my God. There is no witch on this earth that is will bring fear into my heart. You can mix eggs and throw eggs and all whatever kind of witchcraft there is, and I will not fear. I ain't gonna be scared. You can call whoever they want to call, whether it's voodoo, whether it's santeria, whether it's santa muerte. I am not fearful. I am not afraid because the power of Christ is greater than anything that we can ever encounter. So no matter, no matter what tactic your enemies use, we got to pray for them. Yes. We got to bless them. We got to love them. I saw a black cat. Crossing my way too. So Luke 6 says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. 
Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Let me, let me make a revelation in your life. That some enemies that we have in our lives, we created. Some enemies in our life, we created them. We have made them to be enemies. We have two types of enemies. We have one enemies that we did not provoke, that we didn't um, call them to be our enemies, that we didn't do anything to them. We didn't say anything about them. But then we have other enemies that we created, that we have made them out to be enemies. Our words made them our enemies. Our pride made them our enemies. We are not always innocent victims. Beloved, if you can hear that. So I think someone turned on the heater. Like that person's my enemy right now. Cause, uh, so, so whoever turned on the heater, Brother Paul, uh, my enemies are messing with the thermostat out there. If you can change that. I feel it up here. And I know it ain't the spirit. I feel the spirit, but man, it's hot. So as some enemies we have created. Our words, our actions, our pride. We are not always innocent victims. If we would have handled things in a godly way, there are a way for us to diffuse our enemies. Sometimes we have provoked our enemies. You ever see a snake that just goes out there looking to hurt people? Uh, the majority of the time, snakes are afraid of people. If you see a snake out in the wilderness, more than likely it's trying to get away from you. It's not trying to attack you. But what happens when we get brave in a big stick and we go out there and we start provoking that snake? Well, I'm going to see if I, can, if I can hear the rattler. I don't hear it. I want to hear it. So you go out there and you provoke it. And, and you go out there and you start picking at it. And you go out there and you start kicking at it. Look, look, I'm going to pick it up. And when you do that, you get bit. And the venom that is in that snake will now be in you because you provoke that snake. We went searching for some of our enemies. We went knocking on their doors. We got in their business. We caused the quarrel. Let me show you Proverbs 26, 17. Proverbs 26, 17. And some of you are going to love this verse and some of you are going to cringe. <laughs> Proverbs 26, 17. Look at this, beloved. And remember, this is not for not any certain individual. I actually planned this lesson a month in advance. A month ago, I was waiting for Mother's Day and everything to get um, to be over with so I can go in the book of Jonah. So this ain't about you. This is truth. <laughs> truth with an F. Proverbs 26, 17 says this. Whoever... Beloved, say whoever. whoever. Meadows in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. If we would mind our own business, uh, we would not always be uh, have so many enemies. What the Bible is saying here is that if you're walking down the street and you see a pit bull, then what were you not going to do? You're not going to go up to that pool, pit bull and grab it by its ears and say, and start beef with it. You're not going to do it. It doesn't make sense. Leave that dog alone. Get on the other side of the street. Don't make eye contact with it. You ever do that? You see a dog on the other side of the street. I ain't looking at you. I'm not, you look at him and he looks at you and he's like, it's on. And he starts barking at you and he starts charging up. And it's like, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to look at you, Mr. Pitbull. I didn't mean to look at you, Mr. Doberman. I didn't mean to look at you, Mr. Rottweiler. If we mind our own business, we can stay out of a lot of trouble, beloved. Not every enemy that we have is because we're just innocent victims. We cause some of our enemies. Amen. We cause some of them. Well, don't look at we run to fight instead of being godly. We run to fight instead of being godly. We are in disobedience when we are creating enemies. To be quarreling, the Bible teaches us to be in sin. To be quarreling, to be fighting, to be arguing, to be slandering, to be gossiping, the Bible says, is sin. 
He's like, wait, wait a minute, Pastor. I, I wanted to hear about Jonah messing up. I didn't want to hear about yeah. me and my enemies. I just want to hear about, I didn't want to hear how he got swallowed by a whale. But understand that unless you get right, you're going to get swallowed by a well. Because that's what disobedience did to Jonah. What will, be diso what will disobedience bring to us? So I'm going to get off that subject. Other enemies we did not provoke. We didn't do anything to them. We truly, indeed, we are truly, truly innocent. We didn't do anything to them. We stayed on the other side of the street. We didn't make eye contact. We were just going about our business. Animosity just came out of the blue unprovoked. Because there are bitter people throughout this world. There are bitter people in churches. And you best believe there's bitter people in your family. And what do bitter people like to do? They like to hurt people. They want to hurt people. They want to hurt you. There are some people that cannot be happy with being at peace. They have to be fighting in order for them to be happy. You know people like that. They can't just say, hey man, everything's good right now. Like, I'm just good. If they feel that, they're like, nah, I need to go fight with somebody. Let me get on Facebook. Let me see who's talking about me. Let me see who's posting up pictures that I don't like. Because bitter people love to hate and hurt. Let me tell you this, that bitter people love picking on people that will not defend themselves. If you are a child of Christ and you're like, man, I'm working on it. I'm going to bite my tongue. I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm not going to say anything. The more that they will pick on you. And they're just waiting for you to come out in the flesh because they will say, I knew it all along. You're a hypocrite. Right. And they do that on purpose. They provoke and they provoke and they provoke until they get a response. And they're going to be like, I knew it. I knew it. You're fake. You're a phony. You're this. You're that. That's what the enemy tries to do. do. Psalm 109, 1 through 5 says this. If you have enemies that you did not provoke. <coughs> David was praying about his enemies. You know, the Bible says pray about your enemies. Uh, this is a prayer for your enemies. Found in Psalm 109, 1 through 5. Do not be silent, O God of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. Some of our enemies are formal friends. Some of our enemies are people that we used to love, that we used to kick it with, that we used to confide in. And everything that you told them, now that you're your enemies, they spread all of that around. What you said to them in secret, they are now making public because they are your enemies. See, this scripture applies to so many of us. I got haters myself. I know exactly what you were going through. I know there are people that curse my name. And they say all kinds of different things about me. Because I am uh, going to boldly witness the message of Christ. And I don't care who says what about it. Because my enemies do not make me lose one minute of peace. I thank God for thick skin and a big belly. Amen. I thank God for that. That I don't care what people say about me. They can say whatever they want about me. And I don't care because the Bible says that we're going to be encircled of words of hate. People are going to attack you without cause. And, and trying to love people. And, 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 and instead of them accepting that love, they pay you evil for evil. You ever let somebody borrow money and, and, and they don't pay you back? And you go and ask them for that money and they make it a big deal like it's about you? And they start calling you all these different names. Like, bro, I, I tried to help you. I tried to help you. What, what are you getting mad about? We had someone live with us one time. And, uh, had all, we had rules in our house and he stole money from us. And I was talking to him on the phone and he started cussing at me. 
And I said, you know what, bro, you, you got to move out. I said, man, I, all I wanted to do was help you. All I wanted to do was provide a home for you. And it instantly calmed him down. And I, I'm thankful for that. I know he's still angry at me. I know that he still, I would consider an enemy. But sometimes you just got to remind people, hey, man, I, I love you. If what I say to you, it's because I love you. Because if I hated you, I would let you do whatever you want to do. If I hated you, I would let you face the consequences and the condemnation of God. We go back to Luke 6. Uh, this is where some Christians, we can say, okay, pray for them. We can say, okay, bless them. We can say, okay, uh, help them. This is where Christians refuse to budge. Where we say, okay, yes, that's in the Bible. Yes, that's the words of Christ, but I'm not going to do it. Luke 6, 29 says this. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. We've heard the saying, turn the other cheek. I had my boss one time tell me that that was um, something that he could not live by. He said, I think that is so weak. He doesn't believe in God. We as Christians, we are called to turn the other cheek. It doesn't mean that we allow ourselves to get beaten. Although we see through the life of Martin Luther King, who brought the greatest change in civil rights in these United States, that he indeed did turn the other cheek. And he allowed not only him, but his followers to get beaten, to get burned, to get thrown in jail, to get dogs attacked on them. He chose to turn the other cheek and God blessed it and you and I are free today because of it. So when people say, well, that's not really what the Bible means, that is, that is not true. Because Martin Luther King showed us that it is true, that you can turn the other cheek, that you can take a beating for the cause. Martin Luther King taught us that. But we try to justify it. Uh, you know, somebody puts their hands on you, then put your hands back on them. That's what we justify with it. But that's not what the Bible is saying here. It's not saying, hey, you know what, let someone kill you and just sit aside. But, you know, somebody can slap you and you can walk away. The only thing that is hurt is your pride. Now, believe me, I haven't had nobody slap me other than my mama in quite a while. Uh, so I'm not sure how I would react in this. We talked about that last week on Mother's Day, right? But... <laughs> I am not sure how I would react, but I know how I'm supposed to react. I'm not going to get up here and lie and say, you know what, I'm going to turn my other cheek, turn my other cheek, turn around, let them kick me in the back. But I know how I'm supposed to act. I know what I'm supposed to do. The Bible goes on to say in Luke 29, and from the one who takes away your cloak, your outer garment, uh, do not withhold your tunic, your inner garment. That's saying if someone takes your jacket, then give them your shirt as well. Verse 30, give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. See, this is where the Bible gets almost unbearable. This is where the words of Christ cannot be fake, but it is only by the Holy Spirit to not want to go out and get what's yours back. We can't do that on our own. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can do that. Where someone took money from us, where someone borrowed and didn't give it back. And we can be so filled with the Spirit that we can say, you know what, bro, you keep it. You keep it. I'm not going to let that separate me and you. What do they say about families? Never let them borrow money and never do business with family. That is a cold, hard truth. But if we did do that, and we were burned... We have to let it go. We have to be reconciled. We cannot be separated from people that we love for $100. We cannot let money separate us from God. Because when you're so mad at your enemies, you can't get close to God. When you're so mad, when your heart is filled with so much hatred, you can't read, you can't pray, you can't lift your hands in worship. It's almost impossible for that to happen. 
Because our hearts are not right. Verse 31. And as you wish that others would do to you, so do to them. If you don't want other people in your business, don't get in other, anybody else's business. If you don't want nobody talking about you, then don't talk about anybody else. If you don't want anybody slandering you, then don't slander anybody else. If you don't want anyone talking about your marriage, then don't talk about anybody else's marriage. See how that works? You worry about you, beloved, and you will be at peace. So we are to love. We are to bless. We are to forgive. We are to give to our enemies. We are also to be examples to our enemies. Luke 6, 32 goes on to say this. If those who love you, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. This is what separates a Christian from a wannabe Christian. And if you lend to those who, from you, you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. Verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. Be merciful as your father is merciful. How can we experience the love, the grace, and the mercy of God if we are unwilling to share it to our uh, people that we love? How can we experience the mercy of God and give it to people that are unworthy of it? It's almost impossible to experience the grace of God and not share it. It's almost impossible to experience the mercy of God and not share it. The Bible says those who show mercy will be shown mercy. Or if you got something you need to be forgiven of, then you got to forgive people around you. The Bible says to pray for your neighbors and pray for your enemies because a lot of times it's the same person. The Bible says pray for your family and pray for your enemies because a lot of times it's the same person. Uh, beloved, we have to remove that from our hearts. It is an anchor that will drown you, beloved. It will drown you. I know right now as I'm preaching this message on, on, on enemies, I know they're flashing through your mind. And you imagine them laughing at you. You imagine them mocking you. You imagine them just winning. Sometimes when we think, I gotta pray for them, I gotta love them, I gotta embrace them, they're winning. They're winning, and we hate for that to happen. Martin Luther King said this. We have it there on the screen. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid, meaning lacking, of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. When we see that none of us are truly good, if we see that none of us are truly, truly perfect, and it is easier to forgive our enemies. There have been times when me and you have been enemies. There have been times when we have been the one who provoked. When we were the ones who preyed on the innocent. When we were the ones who were hating people. I'm going to close with this scripture. It doesn't mean that I'm closing soon, but I'm closing with this scripture. Romans 12, verse 14 through 21, says this. Beloved, I, I, I want you to hear this. I want you to allow the word of God to sink in and soak it up. 
Don't let it just go through one ear and out the other. Don't decide in your hearts, I will not submit. Don't do that. The Bible says, repay no one evil for evil. But give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Now understand this. We cannot change our enemies. We can't change our family. We can't change our children. We can't change our spouses. All we can do is that on our end, it's all love. On our end, it's all about peace. It means when they start talking, when they start bumping their gums, just walk away. Beloved, if we would walk away, we would save ourselves from so much heartache. You ever see how when you get angry, you start saying things that you don't mean? Or sometimes you mean them, but you shouldn't have said them? You know the best way to solve that? Politely, but boldly? Shut up. <laughs> that is the way how to stop yourself. Shut up and walk away. With my wife, when I feel myself getting a little heated, I shut up and I walk away. So let me go to the couch because... Um, it's not going to do any good for us to argue. And she hates that. Because she wants to talk about it until we get it right. That moment, then I can take her to Brahms. And then I can take her, put gas in her car. I want to fix it right now. I was like, no, nah, this is going to be a couple of days. <laughs> this ain't going to be over that quick, honey. And I walk away. And I shut up. That is not the old Raymond. That is not the nine year, 19 year old Raymond that um, Pastor Esther slapped. <laughs> that was not that Raymond. My mom taught me to respect my wife. My mom taught me how to um, consider everything that she says. My mom taught me how to be a good husband. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Be at peace with everyone. When you know you're angry, beloved, let me tell you this, stay off of Facebook. When you know that you're angry, don't put it out there for everyone to see. You give your phone to someone, you say, hey, put a, put a password on that. So I can't, I can't unlock it. I can make an emergency call, but I can't, I can't take it out. For those of us at work, you ever sent an email? And, and you were mad when you sent it, you had cap locks on, and you, you were yelling inside of your email, and then you, you, you type it up, and it's like, man, wish I could send it. And then you accidentally send it, and he's like, oh, man, man, I, I wish I could unsend it. And you go and you try to make amends. I've done that before. Yeah. I've sent emails before that I didn't mean to send, because I type stuff out. This is how I work. I type it out, and then I edit what I type to make it sound a little bit nicer. I edit my words. And I accidentally sent it out. And I sent it out to my boss. And it wasn't something that was like going to get me fired. But it was something that was out of the conduct of what a Christian should be. We have to be careful with our words. We build and we destroy people all around us with our words. Even our enemies. If we are too busy cursing them, how can we ever bless them? Say that again, beloved. If you're always cursing your enemies, how can you ever bless them? When we learn how to walk away and be silent, then the Spirit is victorious inside of us. The Spirit is victorious inside of us. So as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone it says repay no one evil for evil you know i was joking when i was talking about um the witchcraft but i know so many people who come to me and and it's almost like their god against our god and they come and they they're so fearful and, and you can see the dread and the terror inside of us like i think someone's putting curses on me and, and to me beloved that's like being scared of the boogeyman it's like I, 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 I don't see why we need to fear those things. Because they have no power over us. The only people that they have a power over are those who are not covered by the blood of Christ. 
those who are not covered by the blood of Christ. Because let me tell you, the enemy, the Bible says, is the God of this world. That he can operate in supernatural ways as well. If you read your Bible, you can see that he can indeed possess people. He can possess children. We read that in the Bible. Understand, in the New Testament we read that. It has not changed. The enemy is lurking everywhere. But there's no power over a Christian. We cannot be possessed. Although we act like it sometimes as not really us being possessed because we are covered by the blood of Christ. You know, you've seen some people, it's like, whoa, the power of Christ compels you, right? And it's like watching the exorcist. We cannot repay evil for evil. I know that there's some men here. And not only do you have enemies, that you have people that are willing to take your life. There have been 10 murders in the last week. They weren't all drug deals. They weren't all people that just um, living lives of sin necessarily. But murder is all around us. Innocent people die every single day. Where you can be driving down the street and somebody cuts you off and you honk on them and they wait beside you and they shoot at you. Not caring if you have a child seat in the back seat. Not caring if you have your family and your kids. Maybe we should think about that when we're flipping people off, when we're tailgating people, when we're cutting people off, that our families are with us. Enemies are all around us, but the Bible says do not repay evil for evil. If someone is trying to kill you, the response is not to kill them first. That is what the world tells us. If someone is trying to kill you, you kill them first. We cannot repay evil for evil. The Bible says those who live by the sword will what, beloved? Die by the sword. If you live by the gun, if the gun solves all your problems, then you will die by the gun. That's why most murderers are murdered themselves. They brought that upon themselves. So don't repay evil for evil. Uh, verse 19, I want you to see this scripture. When you think about, well, what about when they're trying to kill me? What about when they're hunting me down? What about when they're trying to cause me evil? Understand that God will protect you, beloved. If you have faith, have faith in him. If you have faith that he saved you of your sins, have faith that he will rescue you. The Bible teaches that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. I believe that. So verse 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it. Oh, would you, would you hear that, beloved? Don't avenge yourselves. Leave it. Leaves it that simple. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it. We don't need to take revenge. We don't need to take revenge. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, this is God saying this, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, then feed him. If he is thirsty, then give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As Christians, we do not have victory when we stoop to the level of our enemies. When we get on their level, when we do the, what they want us to do, then they win. The enemy win. God does not win. But when we do what the Bible is calling us to do, then we are victorious. That we win a victory for Christ. That they can look at that and say, okay, he is for real about his faith. He is for real about the God that he serves when we can love our enemies. We just read that scripture says, if we love those who love us, even sinners can do that. Anybody can do that. Love people who love them. But when you love people who hate you, then you are showing that you serve a mighty God, beloved. We're showing that. So I want to take that all the way back to Jonah. Back to our opening scripture. Jonah 1, 1 and 1, 3. Everything that we just preached about. Now the word of God came to Jonah. 
the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it for their evil. For it has came up before me. In essence, God was telling Jonah to go before his enemies, to preach to them, to pray for them, to bless them, in essence, to feed them the word of God, to give them the living waters of God. But Jonah chose to disobey. Jonah chose not to forgive his enemies. Jonah chose to continue letting his enemies be his enemies, even if it was the commands of God. So after hearing this message, you have decided for yourselves how you, you will treat your enemies. You've already decided that. There's, I can go another 30 minutes and it will not change your heart's perspective because you are going to do what you want to do. You're all grown. But understand that Jonah did what he wants to do and God didn't just let him get away with it. That as the story of Jonah begins, it begins with his treatment of his enemies. Everything that Jonah experienced, he experienced because he refused to pray, to love, to embrace his enemies. Understand that, beloved. That if you have enemies and you, you are unwilling, then the consequences that come with it, and they will come with it, are our own fault. We cannot blame God because of the consequences of our sin. We can't do that. We've earned it. We've earned his wrath. We've earned his judgment. I had the, the exact miles, the mileage, but I, I, I didn't write it down. But Nineveh was to the north. Not a short distance, but it was closer than where he went. So God told him to go north, not too far away, uh, but Jonah chose to go west, even taking a ship and crossing the seas to a farther place than where God was calling him. So if you want to see results in your faith, if you want to be closer to God, if you're praying for things and you want them answered, understanding the quickest way to get there is by the obedience to God's will and God's command. Meaning is if God is calling you to point A, he is going to bless you for your obedience. But if you go to go to B, if you choose to go the other way, then God's going to end up bringing you back to where he wanted you to go. But you're going to have to go the long way round. You're going to have to take the hard trip. You're going to have to circle around that mountain for 40 years and 40 nights. And, and you will suffer. You will suffer, beloved, if you choose to disobey. I'm going to fast forward. At the end of the story, guess what happened? Jonah went to Nineveh. <laughs> After everything that happened, and we'll talk about that next, next week. After everything happened, God asked him the same exact question. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't say nothing. He said, the Bible says that Jonah went to Nineveh. <laughs> didn't say that he put up a fight. Didn't say that he argued. Didn't say that he grumbled. Because Jonah then understood what disobedience brings. So, beloved, I, I, I want to pray this. I want to pray a special prayer. I understand that you need help forgiving your enemies. I understand that it will not come naturally. I understand that maybe our husbands and our wives are our enemies. And our marriage does not reflect a marriage, but it reflects people that are constantly fighting. People that are constantly, it's not a marriage where we're together, but it is, we're fighting. We're fighting all the time, fighting about petty stuff, fighting about dumb stuff. We can make our family out to be enemies. We can treat, beloved, our children as enemies. We can treat them like they're burdens upon us. And the Bible says that children are a blessing, beloved. They are not enemies. If your children are your enemies, you need to get right. You got to pray for them. You got to love them. You can't just say, well, you live life how you want to live it. Don't call on me when you hit the floor. I'm not going to be there for you. We cannot say those things because it is ungodly. 
and it does not reflect the life of a Christian. So I want to offer up a prayer. If you need help, you don't have to talk about the situation. In fact, I, I, I would rather not hear it. I just want you to come forward and I want you to pray for that person. Well, sometimes they expect pastors to be referees. Oh man, it's like a boxing match. It's like Mayweather and, and Pacquiao all over again. People are throwing punches and dodging them and punching back. And <laughs> Pastors are not supposed to be referees. <laughs> Beloved, pastors are not supposed to pick sides. It's not my job to pick a side. In counselings, we try our hardest to not pick sides. We try to offer the truth, and that's where we leave it. So I want you to come forward, and I want you to respond. I want you to pray for yourself first. Because I can't ask you to pray for your enemies if you don't first pray for yourself. And maybe you are your own worst enemy. You ever thought about that? You ever look in the mirror and it's not, you're not liking the person that you see? You can't stand the person that you see. And you look at yourself in the mirror and it's like, that is my enemy. I am my own worst enemy. The pride in that person, the anger in that person, the unforgiveness in that person. It's not about these people that have wronged me. It's this man looking at me in the mirror. It is myself. It is my heart. It is my thoughts. It is my word. I am my own worst enemy. Then come and pray for yourself. So if our brother in the back, our sound tech, can, can put some music on. Let me tell you, in the church... There is nothing that grieves the heart of a pastor more than when people in the church fight. Let me tell you, I, I can worry about cutting grass. Uh, pastor Jose cleans the church. We can do all of these things with a smile on my face. I'm darker. My voice is, is hoarse because we were out there outreaching. And, and I pour my blood, sweat, and tears into this ministry as my mother and father before me have, as me and my wife will do, and maybe my children will do after me. But what grieves my heart the most is when the people of the church fight. Beloved, if your enemy is in this room right now, if your enemy is a member of House of Healing, if your enemy is a visitor of House of Healing, and beloved, you got to get that right. You got to get that right. Because these doors are open to everybody, including your enemies. Because, beloved, when your enemies walk through that door, I am going to greet them with an embrace. I don't care what you feel about them. I am going to welcome them into the house of God. Because by them walking into that church, it is a victory. If you don't like them, if you can't stand them, I don't care. I'm praying for them that they go to that same heaven that you go to, that I go to, that my kids go to. Pray for our enemies. We gotta get right. Would you stand up? Would you stand up? Would you just close your eyes?